Hi, and welcome to the lecture videos of Ubiquitous Computing. My name is Christopher Lahoven, and in the next week we'll see what Ubiquitous Computing really is all about and why it is crucial to know about Ubiquitous Computing for anyone aiming for a university degree that is related to computer science. Now, several decades ago, in the early 1990s, a scientist called Mark Weiser wrote an article called The Computer for the 21st Century. And this was a very visionary paper. In it, he presented the blueprints for how computers could be used anywhere by anyone. Computers were at the time very big and clunky and expensive and required lots of training before you could really use them. He made connections between computing and communication and sensing and several of his ideas at the time actually were implemented decades later and many of his ubiquitous computing visions are still as relevant today as they were back then. So just think how fast certain devices, certain types of computers have become commonplace nowadays. You know, smartphones have pushed through in the last decade only yet they are now by many people the most used computer. So what type of computers will we, be, will we be using in the next 10 years from now? And can we predict what type of computer this will be? Will we, for instance, get up and then head towards a smart mirror that will show us you know, what the weather will be like today or what our vital signs are? Or Perhaps we will use earbuds. You know, most, of them, most of us are using already earbuds just for listening to music um, or having a conversation over the phone. However, maybe we will use them for many other things and maybe they will have lots of sensors embedded into them. And what will smart watches develop into? You know, only 10 years ago, nobody really cared about watches anymore because mobile phones were then the main way of telling time. Nowadays, lots of people have started smart, wearing smartwatches. You know, will we be using and will be be using smartwatches for more and more applications? These are some of the questions that we'll have. The same for smart fridges. You know, smart fridges is not a new idea. Smart fridges have been around for ages already, but slowly technology is advancing in such a way that these things might actually be realizable not having just a screen on your fridge that will tell you the time, but more, you know, the fridge will be able to tell you whether the th contents of the fridge are expiring, what type of contents you, you need to shop for next, etc. Will we be using those type of fridges in 10 years? And what about smart glasses? Everybody knows nowadays about Google Glass, uh, but there are more uh, prototypes like this appearing every day. And will or any of these be interesting enough for most of us to wear, even those without glasses? Those are the type of questions we'll be looking at. And it's not just about form factors of computers, it's also about how information, and this is what computer science is all about, how information will be flowing. At the moment, most of our information is going into one direction and a little bit back. You know, our sensor data that uh, our wearables produce, our computers are producing, are going straight over the internet to a server somewhere in a cloud. Will this be continuing? Or will our information be more and more locally processed? So not everything is shared through a cloud and the cloud is only used for certain things only. All these things are very important, especially for us computer scientists. So that is why we ask ourselves in this course the one main question, how can we as computer scientists prepare for this future that is very uncertain, but perhaps certain things of which we can predict? How can we prepare for exactly this? And we won't just be looking at how technology is advancing, because we're still in a very luxurious situation there. Through Moore's law and other types of trends, we know that our technology is advancing at a really rapid pace, an exponential pace. So we can expect that, for instance, memory or computing power will continue to grow really, really fast. But this is only one aspect, as we will see in this course. There are other things that also play crucial roles. For instance, the social aspects, how people adopt new types of technologies, for instance. Or what computing should be doing, you know, how people would like to use computers in the future. And for this, I have a couple of examples first to start with. 
Now, our first example is a technology from long, long time ago. So the Kodak camera was at the time a little box that you could take anywhere to take pictures. And this was revolutionary because before that cameras were big, clunky, they needed a big manual and people needed lots of training to use them. And suddenly you had this little box where you could just press the button. In fact, that was one of the slogans for the first Kodak cameras. You press the button, we do the rest. And the company that produced Kodak um, could make these really cheap and could mass produce them so that anyone could suddenly take pictures anywhere. Now you might think that this is a very nice thing to have, that people would have you know, just grabbed those Kodak cameras and hailed this new technological advance as something that is really great. So when the Kodak cameras appeared on the market in about 1890, the appearance of these and the pervasiveness was so sudden that the reaction of many people was not positive at all. It was rather negative or a reaction of fear. Lots of articles talked about people suddenly being able to snap pictures of anyone. For instance, on beaches where people were swimming around and then would suddenly be taking their pictures off. Um, and as a response, there were signs put up anywhere, not just on beaches, but also at monuments that Kodak people or people with Kodak cameras were not allowed to walk around there. So it was not that easy in the first couple of years or even first decades of the Kodak camera. But as this technology progressed and as it especially became cheaper and more available, more and more people bought the Kodak camera, even though the original press was quite negative. And a similar opposition can be seen also in other areas where suddenly a technology is introduced where people don't know really what to expect. You know, the first landline telephones had exactly the same negative press in the beginning. People could just call you and push their music into your ears. There was also a lot of misconception about, uh, about for instance, wire transmitted germs. Uh, and the same happened for the first mobile phones, where even though the first mobile phones were for the really rich people that you know, could afford them, after a while they became so cheap that they were also frowned upon because everybody had a mobile phone. So all these developments don't really have a technological side to it, but more of a social acceptance side, which is, I think, very important to uh, have in mind when you talk about ubiquitous computing. And also for the first smartphones, you know, the first reactions were not always that positive. You know, many people, for instance, complained at first about the touchscreen buttons. How could you use touchscreen buttons? Bad idea, this thing will never work. Now, a second example that we will see where ubiquitous computing is not really about the technology all the time is a slide from Mark Weiser himself from the 90s, where he talks about the flow state. And in it, he asked us to remember the last time we spent several productive hours with something. And it would need to have the following characteristics. It, time had to pass by without you noticing. So suddenly it was three hours later, for instance. Or you were not really noticing what was going on around you. You were blocking out sounds and things, events happening all around you. It did take a little bit of time to get engaged in this task. But when you did, you suddenly just focused on the goal, on the target, on the task at hand. And unconsciously, you drew in lots of information from everywhere. Without you actually retrieving or getting this information actively, you just got this information and did what the task required you to do. And usually, in these situations, there are loads of details, lots of nuances uh, that you really can't put often in words, but you took that all and you use that in your task. Now in this case, when you were in this flow state, you did not think, think about what you had to do, you did not have a, a list of things, and you did not actively think about this. But the things you could not really grasp, the tacit, the context, the world, all of those things made you smart and made you do these things in, extraordinary, in an extraordinary way. Examples here are, for instance, surgeons who carry out a very complex operation. And this operation, while they're doing this, is not about um, them thinking, oh, I have to move the scalpel in exactly this way. Because of their training, because of their flow states, they just do it. 
The same can happen, for instance, for computer programmers. If you're programming a piece of software and you're really thinking about what you want to do, then that is all you'll do. You'll not think about the integrated development environment that you're in. Or you're not thinking about what keys you have to type or how you have to use your mouse button. You're just doing this and all you think about is the programming language and what you're doing in it. Or the same can be happening for many things. For instance, musical instruments is another good example. If you're playing a good, an instrument that you're good at, you'll just play the music. You're not thinking about what key you have to press where in the, in the music piece. You just do it. You just flow with the music and just play the music as such. And this flow state, Mark Weiser uh, talks about is one of the aims of ubiquitous computing because in this case you don't really think about the technology how you use the technology you just execute a certain task and the technology helps you here in a perfect way and it's not always about the technology being perfect it's also about the person being able to use the technology in such a way that you don't think about the technology you think about what is happening in your task and that is actually what ubiquitous computing or computing should be about, he states. So Mark Weiser was also looking at things a little bit in a historical perspective. And one of the ways he analyzed things was uh, through how many computers were being used by how many users. And you could do this on different types of scales. You could, for instance, say how many units of a particular uh, computer are being sell sold, or how many uh, computers are actually being used, or what is the market share of computers. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you have something here in the y-axis that states the pervasiveness of computers. And on the time axis, which is the y-axis, basically there, Mark Weiser was in the 1990s, um, which at the time was somehow in the middle of what he calls the three waves or the three eras of computing. The first type of computer that he identifies, and that is fairly simple, is the mainframe computer. These are really big, gigantic machines taking up often an entire room where multiple people have to stand in the queue in order to be able to use those computers, also requiring lots of knowledge on how to program these and how to use these. Those type of computers kind of peaked in the 1960s. They were getting still produced, but at a less pace at the time. So at the 1960s, you could see that there was this first era of computing, which were the mainframes. Now, a little bit later, another type of computer emerged. And this was a computer that anyone could buy because it was not only cheaper, it was also smaller, so you could put it at home or on your desk at the office. This was called the personal computer. Now, the personal computer had a lot of advantages. People just had their own, uh, could ha use it all the time. They had their own computer. Um, they still had to learn a little bit on how to operate it. But the personal computer was also being uh, uh, opened up to a larger market. Instead of, of having a few engineers working on these mainframes, almost anyone could buy a PC at the time. And that's why at the time it looked like the PC was the architecture, the type of platform that everybody would work upon. But Mark Weiser made the extra jump and said, wait a minute, you would have lots of users for one computer here. You have one user for one computer here. Perhaps, or likely, in the future, you'll have one user being able to operate dozens of computers, perhaps. And these computers would be not just with you, you could perhaps even take them in your pockets or wear them, but you could also meet them in your environment and you would interact with dozens of those in your daily life throughout the day. And that's what he calls the age of ubiquitous computing. Coming much later, being also much bigger. Now Ubicom, as he predicts, is having several challenges just because of that. The main challenge is that all of these computers should somehow be seamlessly interacting with users. And that's what he calls being invisible. 
So to summarize, these three waves of computing, or these three eras of computing, are very different. First of all, they're different in the way you have users and computers. In the first mainframe computing wave in the 50s, you have one computer that is used by many people. In the 70s, you have personal computing jumping up, and, and personal computing, as the name already reflects, is we have one user using one computer for themselves. And from this, Mark Weiser extra extrapolated the fact that ubiquitous computing would be about one user interacting with many computers. And for this to happen, one of the main critical points is that these computers better had to be nearly invincible, he said. And in this case, invincible is not about hiding the computers away somewhere so you would not know that they were not there, or making them as small as they could be so you would not be able to see them. Now, in this case, the invisibility is more about people being so used to a computer that they just don't think about using this computer. That a computer is just another piece of technology, just like you would grab a hammer and then just take it and, then ha and hammer a nail in some piece of wood. Or that you just take a pencil and you just write some words on a piece of paper without thinking about the hammer, without thinking about the pencil, you think about your task, you know, driving the nail in the wood, or writing something on a piece of paper. So if you're in this stage, if technology can be made in such a way, just like we just mentioned for the flow states, that is, should be one of the aims of computing in the future. And this is something that we'll definitely talk about more in the coming weeks. Now, our lecture basically will be held once a week. And every Thursday around midday, these videos will appear and you will be able to see them. You don't all have to go on these videos all at once. Basically, from Thursday on at noon, you will have the lecture videos being online. Most of the information will be at our website. And as you can already see now, most lecture slides are in English, or all lecture slides are in English, and will be available via the Moodle system. So that you can peruse through them, and that sometimes they have links in them, you can click on those and look at more material. Now, after the lectures, we usually have exercises uh, a few hours later, and in these exercises, we'll be applying research methods. Research methods to read scientific papers, to extract the most important information from these scientific papers, and also to create your own research reports in exactly this way, as if it was a research paper, having an abstract, an introduction, an evaluation section perhaps, uh, a literature section at the end, which usually is then written in LaTeX, and for this we will be using an online LaTeX system. At the end of this term, we will have a written exam, because there are quite a few people that have uh, um, enrolled in this course. Now, our goal is not just, however, to write this exam and get great grades. It's also to learn more about the long-term perspectives of computing. And us, with a scientific uh, background in computer science, should interest this. So having these concepts or knowing these concepts that were sometimes already ages old and have been mentioned already decades ago are still valid today and this is something that people should know about. And this is what we will learn in this course. Now here is some background material that you can read. There are some more links on the website for these things. The most important is, of course, these third art articles by Mark Weiser, The Computer for the 21st Century. This is, however, also something that we'll look a little bit deeper into into the next lecture when we talk about the concepts, the main concepts that Ma Mark Weiser introduced in all of his articles uh, related to ubiquitous computing. So thanks for watching, and you can click here to go to the next lecture. See you next time.